I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. I cannot believe that we are at week nine of 10 already. I don't know where the whole lecture series, series has gone. It's been an incredible journey from the end of World War II all the way up to such a short period of time afterwards when we're talking about the span of seven years, almost eight years where so much has changed, how everyone is jubilant at the end of the war and thinking that finally peace is restored to discovering that really it's just the whole process is beginning all over again and trying to find out what the right role is for everyone. And it's, um, it's been amazing. Last week's discussion on the foundations of the Korean conflict had, were enlightening because so many people don't even realize that this conflict occurred. It's, it's the forgotten one. And now one of the trends in modern American history is to call it just one of the major battles of the Cold War. And I'm going, no, it deserves its own place and its own history. And it really bothers me. And so whenever I'm talking to other historians that are proposing, you know, we should just make it the Cold War and talk about this as one of the battles of it. I'm like, no, we have to remember all of those people that did so much. And when Ron is speaking tonight, if you're not familiar with it, you will hear the stories of so many people that did so much and how much things had changed in just such a short period of time. And we had discussed last week how the military of the United States decreased in size exponentially over such a short period of time because everyone wanted that peace dividend. They didn't want their sons to be in the military anymore. And everyone that was in the military, if you were not making it your career, you really wanted to go back and lead a more normal life. Um, so before I turn it over to Ron, I would like to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors are the Fred Birch Jr. Foundation. And um, they are a wonderful family that really wants to promote the idea of service through education. And their philosophy is such a simple one that the more people know about their own history, the more that they will want to serve their own country. And the Birch family has been incredibly generous to us and we appreciate them for that. We also have our second sponsor, our media sponsor is Blue Lake Public Radio. Again, another wonderful institution that is a pillar of our community. And we are very excited that they are both our sponsors. As I said, we only have one more session of this to go. And it is just amazing how quickly this season has gone by. I don't know what I'm going to do for a few weeks, but if you are available on the 18th to the mayor. Any, of November, any of you that are interested in, the Muskegon Area District Library will be doing a presentation on the Ghost Mountain Boys and James Campbell will be there and he will be speaking on the topic. It is a group of us that have gotten together because unfortunately in this current COVID crisis, a lot of institutions budgets have been cut because of many different reasons from closures to not a lot of guests coming in the door. So we've all banded together so that we can pay for Mr. Campbell to make this presentation. The presentation will take place on the Muskegon Area District Library's website and you can go directly to that to register. Um, Teresa will be sending out an email to that effect in the very near future. And we recommend that if you are interested in a unique part of World War II history that talks a lot about young men from our own community because the Ghost Mountain Boys were made up of um, one unit and they were a reserve unit that was nationalized and they were brought in because it's very rare during World War II after the death of siblings they had separated out, so they tried not to have siblings and family members and people from the same community in their battalions together so that the loss would be shared across the country, not felt overwhelmingly so by one community or another. But the Ghost Mountain Boys, because they were a reserve unit that was nationalized, they were all the same young men from the same community. And these young men had the horrific job of marching across New Guinea from one side to the others, 
over what's now known as the Ghost Mountain through some of the most horrendous material, uh, vegetation and weather and muck and bugs and malaria and everything that you can possibly imagine to meet their objective of meeting the Japanese on the other side to try and cut off the supply lines of the Japanese. It's an amazing story and it's about our local community. So I highly recommend that if you are in, available on that day, please join us for that extra added special um, event that we're having. And it'll also be nice because we'll be bringing several different groups together from the library, from the LST and ourselves to have out to sponsor this one speaker. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. All of you that are here, I know we're here last week, so I do not need to go into the whole long story, but you know what a wonderful speaker, what a wonderful researcher, and what a wonderful historian that we have in Ron. And so I will let Ron take over and Ron, you should be able to take over and share the screen without a problem. And if you have not silent, uh, muted yourself, I will mute you at this point. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box during the presentation. And if not, then we will um, open it up for questions at the end. So thank you very much and Welcome, Ron. Thanks, Peggy. We study history because it is our narrative. It is our story of who we are as individuals and as a people, where we are today, what we've come through to get to this point, and those two vectors helping direct us to what's possible in our future. History is us. Welcome all to this evening's USS Silverside Submarine Museum Fall Lecture Series on the World Transformed, 1945 to 1953. Over the past several weeks, as Peggy pointed out, we've circled the globe seeing the events and occurrences that came as a result of World War II, one of the great watersheds of history. Tonight, we return to the final stage of that discussion, that of Korea. Last week, we discussed the, the background, the, the ends to the game, the, the backstory of how we got to Korea, what effects and what events led us to that point. Tonight, we'll actually investigate and share the actual American strategy and how the war was played out over the years from 1950 to 1953. I am your host, Colonel Ron Janowski. In his seminal work, Das Kapital, published in, 18, um, 18, uh, in the 1800s, uh, Karl Marx, theorized that in fact, communism, ownership of the work by the workers would overcome and replace capitalism. Now this was met with great skepticism by the West. Uh, it was preposterous to imagine this might happen. But of course that was all changed. In 1917, the czarist empire of Russia became the first communist country of the Soviet Union. More immediate demands were on the Soviets and the world in bringing down the Nazi empire, the Nazi uh, movement that had taken over Europe and the Japanese empire that had allied with the Nazis and working in the Asian realm. A strange bedfellows war sometimes makes, and in this case, the Western powers, particularly the United States and Britain, allied with communist Russia, communist uh, Soviet Union until the Nazi threat was destroyed. Unfortunately, once that was done, the Red Army, which had moved steadily across Europe, declined to, declined to leave. Occupying many countries of Eastern Europe that had formerly been democratic, the Red Army became the power for the Soviet Union to install 
communist puppet governments friendly to the Soviet Union and furthering the image of the Soviets and the communists extending across and truly fulfilling Karl Mar Marx's um, forecast and proposal that communism would in fact take over the world. A slightly different scenario, but with the same basic effect occurred in Asia. A civil war had been conducted in China for 10 years before the war. Put in abeyance during the war, it concluded for, for four more years at the conclusion of the war, when in 1949, Mao Zedong uh, installed a communist government and the most populous country in the world became the second major communist power in the world. Effectively, in the blink of a historical moment, much of the world suddenly saw the vast majority of the Asian landmass as now being red. And there was fear that in fact, communism might continue to extend by hook or by crook to establish itself and eliminate capitalism. The war had also somewhat simplified the geopolitical nature of the world. Gone were the empires that had divvied up the world between them for the 450 years prior. Now it was reduced to a competition between two superpowers, the United States championing the West and capitalism and the Soviet Union championing the East and communism. President Harry Truman, set forward a policy in which he dictated that the United States is compelled to help all free people to fight against totalitarian, totalitarian regimes. This was a thinly veiled, thinly veiled reference to communism and it was codified in 1947 as the Truman Doctrine. This Truman Doctrine would become the basis of the next 40 years of American foreign policy commonly known today, of course, as the Cold War. And in this Cold War, the United States, often through surrogates, would push back wherever communism attempted to knock down democratic or otherwise free people. This would be done economically, informationally, and if necessary, militarily. To not do this would risk the communist expansion to gain momentum and take over regions, continents, and possibly the world. As it would turn out, only a year after China became communist, the first true test of Truman's doctrine would occur in a small peninsula off the Asian landmass, situated between the mass of China and the aggression of Japan. This, of course, was Korea. Korea had a long history, but had never been a major player in Asian affairs. It was more often a vassal state to China, sometimes gained the interest of even Russia. But since 1910, it had been under the heel of the expanding Japanese, Japanese empire. Now, Korea itself is not terribly big, about 625 miles north to south, about 135 miles at its greatest width. It can be roughly equivalent to the state of Michigan, which frankly is quite a bit smaller than I had expected. Nevertheless, as it came under the heel of the Japanese, it stayed that way for about 35 years. Now, the end of World War II would put an end to the Japanese aggression and would free Korea from that domination. But because of the differing positions of communist and capitalist, the Korean Peninsula was arbitrarily divided in half along the 38th parallel. And the Soviet Union was given control of the Northern half, establishing a communist government, much as they had done in Eastern Europe, while the South was established as a democratic government under the sponsorship of the United States. Now, no one was terribly happy with this division both the United States and the Soviet Union eyed each other with great suspicion. This suspicion had carried over from during the war. 
as the war was winding to a close, Stalin was very suspicious of the Western intentions towards them. And it was no different here that the communists and the capitalists clearly saw each other as competition uh, and the desire was to eliminate the dual governments in Korea into one. The people of Korea too felt quite the same way. Their country had not only been divided geographically, but their homes and their families had been divided as well. Many families shared uh, members on both sides of the border and they too desired that Korea should someday be reunited. There was of course great competition and discussion and disagreement as to which government should take precedence over the other. The far more aggressive Northern Korean government desired to institute a full-fledged invasion of the South and they trained for it. Their military was powerful, it was strong numbering about 90,000 and they wished to invade as soon as possible. But they needed the permission of their sponsors, the Soviet Union. The Soviets did not wish to initiate such an act as long as the United States had a unilateral hold on nuclear weapons. And therefore it was not until the summer of 1950, uh, in 1949 I should say, that the Soviets finally detonated their own atomic weapon and felt that they were on good standing to sponsor an invasion of North Korea into South Korea. On the 25th of June of 1950, the North Korean troops flooded across the 38th parallel dividing line. Now the United States was caught a little flat-footed in this, but they needed to do something to stave off this invasion. There were American troops stationed in Korea, I should say in uh, Japan. At, and in very quick notice, the United States cobbled together a response force, which they sent to Pusan, and then by wheeled vehicle up near the town of Osan. This unit became known as Task Force Smith to history because it was commanded by a Lieutenant Colonel by the name of Charles B. Smith. Smith had very little warning prior to getting sent into this combat situation. And he cobbled together forces that were almost laughably small. Task Force Smith was a total, a total of 540 American soldiers with light weapons, rifles and pistols, some anti-tank weapons such as a bazooka shown in the picture and a small unit of light artillery, 105 self, uh, 105 towed artillery. To this, they were put into a position, astride an avenue of approach from the northern border and told, stop anything that comes your way. It's probably charitable that they did not know what was coming because coming down that way into Task Force Smith was in fact an entire division of the North Korean People's Army, numbering about 5,000 soldiers and supported by three dozen tanks. It's likely that American planners thought that the very fact that Americans were on the scene would cause the North Koreans to pause. It did not. In fact, post-war interviews with North Korean officers, they were shocked that there were Americans there at all. They didn't know. They simply thought this was uh, a small irritating fly that was, just, that was bothering their advance. And Task Force Smith was in fact brushed aside uh, as you might um, some irritating insect. The advance continued with the North Korean forces driving the Southern forces deep into the Southern Peninsula until the Republic of Korea Army of 98,000 was wedged into a small enclave around the city of Kusan in the far southeastern corner of the peninsula. It would seem at this point that the game was all but done. But of course, the United States could not allow that to happen. Truman knew that any allowance of, mo of, of momentum for the uh, communists to allow South Korea to fall into North Korean hands and become a North Korean domino would 
simply lead to further advances in the communist expansion. Although the title domino effect would not come into play until another generation under Kennedy, Truman clearly defined it in these words, that if he allowed it to happen in Korea, they would simply continue on swallowing up land everywhere. American forces in Japan were quickly mobilized and prepared for transit over to Korea. Luckily, the United States did not have to act unilaterally. For the first time in history, the United Nations, newly formed in 1945 from the ashes of the old League of Nations, was able to unify and pull together a military outfit from members of the United Nations. 16 countries provided troops to go directly to Korea in order to counter the North, North Korean aggression. All of these troops totaled up to some 972,000 troops, which sounds pretty darn impressive, except they weren't all combat troops. Many of them were medical, logistics, uh, support troops, combat troops, of which all of these countries did in fact provide some combat power, totaled up to 88,000. I found it particularly interesting looking at this list that Luxembourg sent combat troops to Korea. I have no idea what an angry Luxembourger looks like, but they were there, they were there. And so was Colombia, France, Greece, Ethiopia, and all the rest. The majority came from the United States and the United Kingdom, but every country on this list actually provided combat troops. This combined with the 92,000 remaining South Korean troops in the Pusan perimeter gave the United Nations a combat force of about 180,000 combat troops. This against 90,000 of the North Koreans who were now nestled in South Korea. Now you might think that this is a really good position for the United Nations to just kick back or kick, uh, kick forward and drive the North Korean out of South Korea. But there were still concerns and Truman was very well aware of them. Like a stone dropped in a pond, they rippled out from the invasion and his concerns began with the danger to Japan. The United States had dedicated itself to rebuilding Japan, much as it was doing in Europe with Germany under the Marshall Plan to build both Germany and Japan back into major economic powerhouses. The intention was that by having a strong Germany and a strong Japan, they would obviously defend capitalism and be become a major surrogate bulwark against any further expansion of communism in the region. So under no circumstances could Truman allow any actions in Korea to threaten the economic renaissance that was occurring just across the sea in Japan. The second ripple out from the dropped stone was that of Russia in Europe. Obviously, if the United States became over-focused on what was going on in Asia and in Korea particularly, there was some fear that the Russians might feel themselves free to go ahead and continue expanding, threatening communist expansion into West Germany, France, and possibly beyond. This could not be allowed. And the final and the most terrible of the possible concerns would be that now that nuclear weapons were on both sides of the border, one false step might cause an exchange of nuclear weapons leading to mass annihilation and potentially mutually assured destruction of both sides. These weighed heavy on Truman's mind as he pondered the actions to take in, a, in stopping the aggression that North Korea had affected into South Korea. But Truman had an ace up his sleeve in a sense. He had a man in Japan who had spent nearly 50 years in uniform he was an icon. He was almost a mythological figure. His fame was known throughout the United States and the world, and he had spent a great deal of it in Asia. His name was Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur, by this time, had spent some 
47 years as an officer in the United States Army. He had achieved things that could fill a dozen careers. First of all, he was one of only five five-star generals in the Army, a rank reserved exclusively for wartime. He and four others were the only, two, only ones to achieve the rank of five stars. He had graduated from West Point in 1903 at the top of his class. A rarity of rarities, both he and his father had earned medals of honor. His father at the Battle of Ch uh, Chattanooga in 1864 during the Civil War, he in the Philippines in 1942. He had become a one-star general in World War I. He had become the youngest two-star general in the Army in 1925. By 1930, he was a four-star general and chief of staff of the Army. In 1942, he was named as the Supreme Commander of Southwest Pacific. He co-authored the drives along with Admiral Nimitz of the Navy to bring the Japanese to their knees and force the surrender, which he in fact uh, hosted on the deck of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Harbor in September of 1945. Having won the war, he now turned to peace as he became the Viceroy, the military Viceroy of Japan. And from 1945 to 1948, he was actively rebuilding the entire Japanese community, society, away from a semi-god emperor into a democratic, constitutionally driven republic. Uh, and the economy, as I had previously mentioned, to become a powerhouse in the Pacific. MacArthur was legend, but he was also human. He was incredibly egotistical, highly ambitious. He had a public relations team on his staff that would have been the envy of any politician anywhere in the world. He even referred to himself in the third person. William Manchester in his biography of Douglas MacArthur called him an American Caesar. But for Truman, none of these faux pas may have been of terrible interest. What was most important right now at this moment in that region of the world where MacArthur was in Japan was the Douglas MacArthur was brilliant. And he was the man to take over the forces of the United Nation in Korea. MacArthur's first task, of course, was to stabilize and expand the Pusan perimeter. You can't fight from a, uh, you know, painted into a corner as the United Nations forces were. Surrounded by 90,000 North Korean troops, MacArthur devised and conceived of an operation that would seal his legacy. It would be one of the greatest acts and greatest actions ever committed by a military force anywhere. And had not further events occurred to diminish his stature, this would have set MacArthur as one of the greatest generals in American history, which he already was. But as I say, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there will be further things that will diminish that. What he created, what he devised, he called Operation Chromat. And with the utilization of naval ships, he took 75,000 United Nations troops, put them on ships, and moved them in an amphibious assault on the port of Incheon. It's just outside of Seoul. It is, in fact, Seoul's connection to the sea. He landed the 75,000 troops there on the north side of the North Koreans. And at the same time, he gave orders for an assault by 142,000 United Nations from the other direction. It was a perfect 
double envelopment. And the effects were electric. In the following three to four weeks, United Nations forces discombobulated the, the North Koreans and drove them all the way past the 38th parallel, all the way past Seoul and into the far reaches of North Korea along the Yalu River, which was the border with China. In the process of committing these forces, MacArthur directly violated a, an order that had come from Washington. He had been directed not to allow United Nation troops other than South Koreans to approach the border with China. China had made it very clear that they were sensitive in their first year of existence as a communist government. They were very sensitive to the idea of Western capitalist army figures massing on their Southern border. It was directed therefore that only, only Korean forces would approach the Yalu River. MacArthur discarded this as a recommendation and instead drove his two corps up to the border, one to the west and one to the east, creating great tension, not only in China, but in Washington. The Chinese, Mao Zedong shown on the left, had been closely observing the actions south in Korea for much of the time that the Korean conflict had been in effect. Only five days after the initial North Korean invasion across the 38th parallel, the People's Republic of China began sharing intelligence to North Korea, helping them in their action. By the middle of July, the People's Republic of China had massed forces along their border in the Yalu River. By the end of August, Public, the People's Republic of China formally warned the United Nations not to allow any foreign troops other than Korean to mass anywhere near the Chinese border. By the 1st of October, Stalin on the right now started asking if the People's Republic of China would join this action. By the 10th of October, the People's Republic of China formally coordinated with Stalin. And eight days later, on the 18th of October, Chinese forces moved in, were ordered to move into North Korea. Now, of course, little of these private discussions were known to either Truman or MacArthur. But MacArthur had violated orders. He had moved up, he had caused an increase in tensions on both sides of the Pacific. And Truman, feeling the tension and desirous of no further expansion of this war outside of the Korean Peninsula, decided to visit and meet Douglas MacArthur for the first time. The two men had known each other, but only by reputation and communiques. They had never actually met before. Harry Truman requested a meeting. And of all things, Douglas MacArthur said, I'm too busy to meet the president. Truman took this insult in stride. He needed to meet with MacArthur and he probably had a pretty good idea of MacArthur's personality. Truman went ahead and made the nearly 7,000 mile trip to Wake Island uh, MacArthur conceded that he could travel 2,000 miles to meet with his commander in chief, and the two met for about 40 minutes. As I say, the two probably had a pretty good idea of what they were getting into when they met with each other. Truman, knowing of MacArthur's ego, and MacArthur probably saw, thought something along these lines. Truman's entire military experience was that of an artillery captain in World War I and clearly did not have the knowledge to 
to discuss military matters other than in very cursory terms. The arrogance of MacArthur was well known and it's just one of his personal characteristics. But in this case, he even met, when he met uh, Truman at the plane, he didn't even salute the president as he came down. He simply walked up to him and shook his hands. A breach of protocol, but classically MacArthurian, MacArthur-like. Nevertheless, the two met for 40 minutes in tense but congenial manner. And the most important question that Truman asked was quite simply, what are the odds of China entering this conflict? MacArthur answered confidently and quickly, said, no chance whatsoever, Mr. President. They wouldn't dare. They could not mobilize their forces to enter this conflict. And if they did manage to get a few across the Yalu into North Korea, they would be subject to such destruction by American forces that they would rue the day they ever thought they could join this conflict. Satisfied, Truman flew back to Washington. MacArthur flew back to Tokyo. And 10 days later, China entered the war. The North Korean army of 30,000 remaining were now bolstered by 300,000 Chinese. Against this, the United Nations had now accumulated some 425,000. Uh, this is close to parity, especially with the shock and momentum that the Chinese army brought to the battlefield. From November 1950 until January of 1951, the joint communist forces of North Korea and China drove the UN forces south past the 38th, past Seoul, and well back into South Korea. Attempts were made to slow the advance, the defense of the Chosun Reservoir, the defense of Seoul, but all in vain. The juggernaut that was the communist forces drove on until they reached into, far into South Korea. An unexpected indicator that probably alarmed Truman beyond anything he had expected. Russian built aircraft flying with North Korean markings, radio transmissions were picked up and the pilots were not speaking Korean. They were speaking Russian. Apparently the Russians were using Korea much as Hitler had in the Spanish Civil War uh, to help train his forces to fly against Americans in American aircraft. Clearly, things were starting to get out of hand. And for the first time in his 48 years of service, MacArthur appeared hesitant and somewhat lacking in confidence. He sent messages back to the Pentagon and to Truman declaring that he can save Korea, but only if he is properly supported. And by proper support, what he wanted were three things. He needed 200,000 reinforcements. He needed the Taiwanese, the nationalist Chinese who had been sent off, who had, been, who had lost the war for China against the communists. He needed them brought in. And most shocking of all, he wanted release of nuclear weapons in order to disrupt Chinese supply lines inside China. There are no records of Truman becoming apoplectic, but I imagine he probably was when, when MacArthur requested all of these things and nuclear weapons released. This of course was absolutely unacceptable. Truman's fears about danger to Japan, danger in Europe, and the danger of a third world war probably kept him up many nights after re receiving that. But MacArthur was adamant. He kept pressing that 
if he was not properly supported, one of two things would happen in Korea. Either the entire United Nations forces must be removed and lose the peninsula, or they would be annihilated. Things finally came to a head on the 20th of March, 1951, when MacArthur sent a letter, not to Truman, not to the Pentagon, but to the House Minority Leader, a uh, congressman by the, by the name of Joseph Martin of Massachusetts. And in it, he said, you know, it's a shame that the president and the White House and the Pentagon do not appreciate that we are fighting freedom's battle here and we are protecting Europe as well. Because surely, as soon as it, they fall here to communism, we will lose the battle in Europe as well. It's just a shame they don't appreciate what I'm doing for them. This policy is just ludicrous. Words to that effect. He closed the letter with a rather grandiose and melodramatic statement. There is no substitute for victory. Now, I gotta tell you, my dad admired MacArthur greatly. My dad was actually in Korea after the war. He, he did. But there's no getting around that MacArthur had a personality that was like, I don't know, fingernails on a, on a blackboard sometimes. And this final note could have been his epitaph for his military career. He had pitted himself as a soldier against his commander in chief. And it doesn't matter if you're a private or a five-star general, you just don't do that. The outcome was obvious. And perhaps they say that MacArthur may have even known that. He may have well have known that by writing that letter to a congressman, that it would quickly get disseminated around Washington and would lead to exactly what he knew would happen and did happen. On April 11th, Truman fired Douglas MacArthur. I don't know about the rest of the world, but the United States was shocked. Truman was actually the brunt of some of the initial shock as he was deemed as being a little over his head in military affairs and attempting to take the mantle of the great Douglas MacArthur. But suffice it to say that his bold move to, rem to remove MacArthur shocked the American public at all levels. But Truman stuck by his guns. He said it was not because of any military mismanagement that I relieved and removed Douglas MacArthur. It's because he was a damn fool and he disregarded the authority of the president. MacArthur, who had spent about 15 or 16 years in Korea, he was in the Philippines when the war first broke out, came home for the first time in that all that time to the United States to a hero's welcome ticker tape parades in New York City, addressing Congress. And for a brief time, the groundswell was so great that he considered running for president on the Republican ticket in 1952. Polls did not support that. And ultimately, MacArthur went into retirement with his famous statement that old soldiers do not die, they simply fade away. And so he did go into retirement and it was in retirement some 13 years later in 1964 that Douglas MacArthur died. But back in Korea, the war was still on. MacArthur was out, Matthew Ridgway was in. General Matthew Ridgway was a highly respected combat officer. He had fought at Normandy. He had jumped in with the airborne at Normandy. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He fought across Europe um, to defeat uh, the Nazis. He had fought in, the, uh, uh, in Sicily and in Italy and had finally gotten out to the far reaches of the Pacific. And he was one of the two core commanders under MacArthur and the United Nations forces fighting in Korea in 1952-53. 
he was a natural choice and was elevated to the commander of United Nations forces upon MacArthur's departure. Without demanding the reinforcements, without certainly demanding uh, the Taiwanese or nuclear weapons, Ridgeway was able to stabilize the situation in South Korea and slowly start to consolidate and move north, pushing the Chinese and the North Koreans northward. Now, in all of my presentation to this point, I've only spoken of land operations as if the army was the only one there. It, they weren't. This was truly a combined arms operation. Army, Navy, and the newly separate branch of the Air Force. The Air Force provided heavy bombing throughout North Korea throughout the war. Naval carrier aircraft provided close air support to land operations. The North Koreans had no effective Navy per se, so there was next to nothing in the way of naval combat. But in the air, a new event, that for the first time dogfighting was conducted by jet aircraft. American F-86 on the top, uh, Soviet built, Russian built MiG-17s down below, conducted dogfighting across uh, the skies of North Korea and South Korea. Uh, the two aircraft were relatively equal in capabilities, slight differences here and there, but nevertheless, American training provided a kill ratio of seven to one throughout the course of the war. It had first been reported as 14 to one, but that was later revised to seven to one, still a, a great feat and a great uh, testimony to American pilot training. Back to Ridgeway, he did continue to move forward, recaptured Seoul on the 28th of February of 1951, and slowly began moving the forces further. But both sides were absolutely exhausted by this side. Both the communists and the UN forces slugged it out until finally reaching a position about 40 miles north of Seoul in which there was a stalemate. The fighting had been brutal and in brutal conditions. Blazing summers, freezing, freezing winters, many deaths on both sides. And it caught in the middle of it all were the people of Korea. And then on July 20, 27th of 1953, both sides agreed to an armistice, a truce, a ceasefire, not an end to the war, but only a ceasefire truce. The armistice line was set along the final demarcation 40 miles north of Seoul. And that's only about 40 miles north of where the original 38th parallel had placed them at the very beginning, some three years earlier. Casualties, over half a million of UN forces. Three times that for North Korea. And though never to be validated or confirmed, it was thought that the Chinese had lost about a million. And for what? Brutal fighting. People caught in the middle of it all. And after all of that, a truce. Not an end, just a truce. Where, by the way, it still stands today. Korean War has never been ended. Only a truce. So, what is the legacy? What is the resolution to what transpired for those years in Korea? We'll discuss that next week. We will revisit for our final session of Korea and our final session of the fall lecture series. And we'll discuss the resolution and the legacy of the Korean War. What questions do you have? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions that you have. 
I'd like to ask, uh, what effect, now I understand when uh, MacArthur came back and uh, uh, he had his uh, ticker tape parade and made his speech before Congress, uh, yes, he was a hero, but as I understand it, he continued to make speeches. There was one speech that he made, I believe, to the American Legion, where he came across as a, uh, uh, not in a favorable light. Yep. And uh, uh, it, it didn't take very long after he returned that he uh, he turned the country against him rather than against Truman. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Uh, this is probably what led to him not pursuing the presidency in 1952. True. People of the United States were, uh, you know, they had sunk resources, lives, money, effort. It wasn't, it wasn't something that they would easily accept somebody coming back and saying, oh, never mind all that. It's been a failure. Pull out. Uh, we can already, I mean, we can see uh, some of the blowback that in our own history recently that uh, people have leveled towards administrations that have withdrawn from Iraq or from, uh, from Afghanistan. What loss of life we provided in those areas and now here we are giving it away as if nothing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a standard uh, syndrome and certainly one that uh, MacArthur brought on himself. Oh, thank you. Colonel, why do we call it a police action or why do we know of it as a police action? <laughs> because it was never declared as a war, it was declared as a police action by the United Nations in providing United Nations forces. Uh, and I, I talk about that a bit next week, that it was in fact the first time that the United States or the United Nations stepped in. But the United Nations cannot declare war on another country. They can only do a policing action to try to bring uh, a country into line with the rest of the world. Mm. Semantics. Thanks. <laughs> Can I say something? Sure, go sure. ahead. I think it was an excellent presentation. And I think that had the United States not pursued it, that communism would have run rampant. If we lost, never know. If we lost Korea, we lost half the world or more. Well, certainly, that uh, that concept was not damaged by what transpired in Korea. Uh, Kennedy and his best and brightest certainly adhere to that same belief that they could not allow any country, even something as small as uh, Vietnam, to fall to communism for fear of uh, expansion. Now, I've got a slide next week which shows that in the years after Vietnam's conclusion, uh, we had a handful of countries that did go communist, but a handful of others that didn't. Uh, we will never know. We'll never know what might have happened. I'm glad we didn't have to find out. Hmm. <laughs> Ditto. Uh, can I ask a technical question? As an Army engineer, I uh, refer to uh, Korea as an engineer war, but uh, I'm just prejudiced that way. But also as a logistician, uh, what impact did the uh, length of supply lines, uh, the UN forces from Busan, uh, the Chinese from the Chinese border, uh, the, the eventual uh, truce was along the line halfway between the two. Was that partially caused by uh, the logistics, uh, the length of uh, logistics lines that they had to maintain? Uh, it, it probably was. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of making it up as I go along now. I do know that I can quote uh, no less than General Bradley, one of the other five-star generals, to say that, uh, in fact, the uh, Red Ball Express and logistics won World War II. Logistics drive combat operations far more than a lot of Hollywood people and, uh, you know, and desk, uh, and desk chair uh, lodges, uh, you know, leaders uh, bleep. It had to have made a, played a major part, certainly. 
Uh, and the fact that it ended up the same place where it started, you tend to think that uh, that was almost a natural water finding its own level with logistics. Yeah. And that was the, despite the uh, uh, heavily uh, outnumbered uh, American uh, UN troops, uh, it, it eventually did wind up halfway between. Yes. Yes. I'm sure there had to be a lot of uh, head scratching, realizing that after all that, we're right back where we started. Right. I'd like to mention one other thing. Uh, Wonsan, the, uh, from the Navy side of it, which is uh, one of my interests, the uh, uh, mine, mine warfare, the, in, the landing in Wonsan was held up for uh, two or three weeks because of the, uh, the mines that had been laid in. And to this day, uh, the US Navy has never recovered from uh, the, the mine warfare deficit that we had in Korea. And today we have the same kind of deficit. We cannot face uh, enemy minefields. Mm -hmm. it's just a comment. Yeah, it, it, as it turns out, uh, my last military assignment was in Canada. And this may sound like I'm off on some weird tangent. Let me put my clock finish here first. One of the things that the uh, Canadians had that we were very interested in was ground penetrating radar, where you could actually see a mine uh, underground. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we ground to a stop in pursuing that when we found that their policy was to identify the minefield first and then casually go in under peaceful conditions and find the mines. And we really wanted to have something that we could actually be advancing and find the mines as we're advancing. Uh -huh. So even to this day, finding mines is tough. There you go. Yeah. Tough. Yeah. We never, we don't learn from history. Well, even, uh, there's just no good way. Well, there's one way to find a mine, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no good way to find mines, even today here in the 21st century. True. Well, thank you. Very good presentation. Thank you. Well, thank Ron, you as we're all entering into the holiday season and we, whether we gather with our families virtually or in person, I know my household, I'm not allowed to talk about World War II, but no one has banned me from talking about Korea. And if I wanted to impart knowledge on the next generation, Duration of on um, the Korean conflict, what would be the number one point that you think that I should bring up at the dinner table? About Korea? About Korea. I've been banned from talking about World War II, so I'm sorry. But, uh... You know, I, 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 I dedicated a significant part of my presentation tonight to what I think was the most fascinating thing, and that was the relief of Douglas MacArthur. So it, it's not the combat. It's the unbelievable arrogance of MacArthur to challenge the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that if I were to restrict it to combat operations, I would say it was the difficulty of fighting the Korean War, feeling the Americans felt like they were fighting with one hand tied behind their back. We were fighting in a different kind of world now. Uh, not only were we trying to bring our forces back up to snuff, but we had nuclear weapons on both sides. And the fear of the possibility of exchanging nuclear fires across the border is terrifying to this day. Uh, when I got my, uh, my master's degree, we covered an, uh, an entire semester talking about um, what happens when you launch a nuclear attack. And it's, it's kind of like, that old movie, War Games, where the kid uh, is trying to stop the computer from playing war, it turns out nobody wins. It is more than a slippery slope. It is a rocket-powered jet straight down once nuclear weapons are released. And for MacArthur, and perhaps it was simply because he was old school, and it was he was not fully comprehending that this was not just a big bomb. This was a nuclear weapon, and it would have 
it would have changed the equation everywhere. The fact that MacArthur didn't recognize that and Truman did, he knew the danger there, uh, made the conflict very frustrating for military, typical military. Uh, they wanted to fight all out. They wanted to go for the throat. They wanted to destroy the rear echelons where the logistics were. And an easy way to do that would be uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, in fact, some 10 years after, well, less than 10 years, about five years after, the US military adopted a policy. Uh, let's see, they called it the, uh, oh, the pentathlon, uh, the pentagram, pentagram? Anyway, they, they knew that they could not keep up the number of military forces as the Soviets could without severe, severe detriment to our economy. And so the idea was that they reduce manpower and supplement it with nuclear power. And the United States went all in in the mid to late 50s with lots of nuclear weapons to include a nuclear bazooka. This was awesome. It was called the Davy Crockett. And its bursting radius was greater than its maximum range. So you had, yeah. you had to launch it from behind a mountain and duck. Uh, but the whole, perhaps Korea was the first time that typical, traditional military thinking ran into the deployment of nuclear weapons and found it wanting. Mm. That might be an interesting discussion around the table. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I would, I would think so. And, and thank you, because when I have that discussion, most people say Korea, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's... Uh, that's more than I get at my home. Whenever I, my wife only asks me to talk history when she wants to fall asleep. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, so I appreciate you guys saying I do a, a good presentation because it doesn't wash here in the Janowski Wade household. Very good. Very good. You know, well, that, that, that same thing pertains to all the military services. Uh, uh, I, I didn't think about it that way, but uh, not only the Army with its uh, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, the eight-inch, uh, uh, your artillery, uh, the eight-inch gun uh, capable of firing an art, uh, uh, a uh, nuclear round, or the 240 yeah. millimeter, uh, the 240 or 280 millimeter uh, uh, gun, but also the Navy with its anti-submarine weapons, yeah. uh, were nuclear tip, and the Air Force, I'm sure, had... Uh, uh, bombs that uh, uh, yeah. could be routinely carried by uh, by B-47s, B-52s. So that, yeah. that was definitely a, a 50s policy for the for the services. And that existed all the way up into my early years as a lieutenant and a captain. I was trained on a 155 uh, okay. nuclear round. Really? Okay. Yeah, and it uh, the you know the tonnage was not much, but it was there. We had them available. They've been withdrawn now. No, very true. Well, when I was uh, in uh, engineer uh, OCS, we we were trained also for uh, uh, the nuclear, the ADM, the atomic demolition munitions uh, vaults that were spread across sure. uh, Europe. Uh, that, reaching. Yeah, that's uh, until recently. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's no good to... answer. Yeah. yeah, Rem put in a comment in the, the chat box about Dr. Strangelove, and I just started thinking about LeMay and his, uh, his legacy going into the end of um, the Korean conflict and his role in it and um, how he was portrayed in the popular press about things like yeah. that. If you hold on a moment, I'm going to quiet myself for a second here because the museum's phone is... Yeah, LeMay uh, probably could have been put in the same basket as MacArthur, uh, <laughs> thinking of nukes as simply a bigger bang. <laughs> and it wasn't. It's, uh, it's a whole new ball game once nuclear weapons are involved. Yeah. Or so yeah. nobody really knew. I mean, they didn't know the effect. Nobody knew that there would be radiation. Um, the guys at Las Cruces thought that it might ignite the, uh, the atmosphere. They didn't know. So there was so much that they didn't know about nuclear weapons and it just, uh, to this day, 
there's no good way to deploy a nuclear weapon in combat. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's been always enlightening and listening to the wonderful presentation and then having the discussions afterwards are just the highlight of my week and I enjoy it. Um, I look forward to seeing you all virtually next week. And if any of you are available on the 18th, the Ghost Mountain Boy presentation is a free presentation. And if you're interested, it is an absolute wonderful, it'll be another wonderful discussion. Next week, we'll also discuss our spring lecture series, which will be starting at the end of February. I can't imagine that we're already in the middle of November and the end of February seems so far away, but it's only just a few short weeks away. And again, we'll have some more intriguing discussions about military history. So thank you all for joining us tonight. And I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.